I'm Anton Hellman. And I'm Teresa Chin. And, and this, this is, is the, the Journal Jam, Jam Podcast. Podcast, where we blend interviews with leading researchers of important emergency medicine journal articles and the best of crowdsourced social media based opinions of emergency medicine providers from around the world. I'm very pleased on this Journal Jam number five on cardiac troponins to have a special guest commentator with us. We have Dr. Andrew Worcester from McMaster University. Dr. Worcester, can you just tell us a little bit about your background in emergency medicine? Well, first of all, Anton, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm an emergency physician. I did my uh, training in clinical epidemiology as well, and for the last 15 years have been the director of research for emergency medicine at Hamilton Health Sciences. Wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about cardiac troponin. You know, there's lots and lots of patients who present to the ED with chest pain. Once we've ruled out in our head all the other potentially life-threatening causes of chest pain, like dissection, PE, esophageal rupture, and STEMI, we're often left wondering whether the patient in front of us with a normal or at least non-ischemic looking ECG may still have ACS. And one of the main goals with these patients is to get them sorted out quickly. You know, we either want to get a quick rule in answer so that we can start treatment early or a quick rule out so we can send them home. Now, traditionally, we've drawn troponins at four and eight hours or something like that after the chest pain started. But there have been multiple recent studies that challenge this slow, costly way of risk stratifying our patients and ask the question of whether we can rule in or out ACS faster, which will hopefully save time and money, not to mention patient flow and the patients incessantly asking when their tests are going to come back. So I've been asking myself, how good are these new algorithms that suggest a one or two hour troponin rule out algorithm? Do we need two sets of troponin or is one adequately sensitive to give us the confidence to send patients home knowing that the chance of an adverse out outcome is minuscule to none? So before we get into this particular study on ruling in and out MI, what can you tell us in general about high sensitivity troponins and their ability to rule out MI in general? Sure. I think that's really important to understand a little bit about uh, troponins. Not all troponins are the same. There are two troponins, troponin I, troponin T, but these are not all the same bioassays. So there are some subtle differences there. The cutoff, however, that's been used across the board for all troponins is something called the 99th percentile. And what that means really is that we're assuming a prevalence of 1% of MI. Now, this was done in a relatively healthy population of uh, patients as, as young as in their 30s. So not exactly your typical ED chest pain population. And so we've used this dichotomously. Any value above the 99th percentile, we're assuming myocardial injury, not necessarily myocardial infarction. Remember, troponin tells us if there's a myocardial injury, so that troponin has been released from the myocardiocytes and is appearing in the blood at higher levels than normal. It could be from plaque rupture, but not necessarily. There are other things that can cause it, uh, sepsis, renal failure. And now with the high sensitivity troponins, even a, an elevated heart rate for a prolonged period of time. So now that we know a little bit about cardiac troponins, let's dive into the interview that Justin Morgenstern conducts with the lead author of the Canadian Medical Association Journal article, Prospective validation of a one-hour algorithm to rule out and rule in acute myocardial infarction using a high-sensitivity cardiac troponin T assay. Dr. Reichlin, welcome to Emergency Medicine Cases Journal Jam. Hey, hi, Justin. Like most providers, I imagine you've seen hundreds or probably thousands of patients presenting with a chief complaint of chest pain. I imagine that most of us feel like we're chest pain experts. Dr. Reichlin, what inspired you to look for a new approach to these patients? 
you know, kind of, I remember the days when I was a, a resident in the emergency room and I was kind of facing all those patients with chest pain. And as you know yourself, if you have a patient with chest pain in front of you and you think that might be a myocardial infarction, that's a stress not only for you, but also for your patient. And then I always felt kind of telling the patient, you know, we're going to test a blood sample now. Then you have to wait six hours and in six hours, we're going to retest again. That's a huge stress for the patient who for those six hours doesn't know what's going on. And and that's the same stress for the doctor. So aside from this, it was blocking off the emergency department. So we were looking kind of, isn't there a more rapid way kind of to triage those patients to the benefit both of the patients as well as of the doctor. Wonderful. I, I found your protocol is a little unusual in that it focuses not just on ruling out patients, but also ruling in ACS. Can you describe your protocol for us and explain why you decided to set it up with multiple arms rather than just focusing on the group we can rule out? Yeah. So, you know, with the with the onset of high sensitive troponin assays, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that the tests help for ruling out uh, myocardial infarction very quickly because if you have a negative troponin or two negative troponins, you you're fine. So rule out kind of soon became obvious that's easy and that's good with the new tests. However, at the same time, kind of those new troponin assays were producing an increasing amount of patients with a mildly elevated cardiac troponin. No one knew in the beginning what to do with this a lot of patients with a minimally elevated troponin. So we felt kind of as important as it is kind of to quickly rule out the myocardial infarction, it is kind of to know which ones are the patients that most likely rule in for myocardial infarction. And so that's why we wanted to come up with kind of two arms. And we realized it's not going to be possible to have one single criterion to make that distinction in rule out and rule in. And we realized we need two. And I think the big advantage of this algorithm is in fact that there is this arm, this rule in arm, you, as you you know, kind of myocardial infarction isn't a biochemical diagnosis only. It's a clinical diagnosis. It doesn't mean that all those patients in the end, in fact, have a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, but roughly 80% of those indeed have an acute MI and that for most of those warrants that you will have a, an invasive assessment. And I think that's the value of this rule in arm in our protocol. So Dr. Worcester, this 80% specificity for troponin for ruling in non-STEMI, uh, wh what's your opinion on that? Well, first of all, let me say that the specificity of these high sensitivity troponins is not nearly what we would hope it would be. In fact, it's it's quite low, down, uh, down around 50%. So the 80%, being 80% sure that an elevated troponin is caused by a plaque rupture really depends on uh, your population. I mean, let's face it, if you've got a, an elderly nursing home population, you know, these people have sepsis and PEs and renal failure. So certainly that 80% plaque rupture wouldn't apply to them. Absolutely. So you got to know your population. That's important. In your introduction, you made one statement that really jumped out at me. You say, the classic diagnostic interpretation of cardiac troponin as a dichotomous variable, troponin negative and troponin positive, no longer seems appropriate. Can you elaborate on that idea for our listeners? Yes, I know that's a it's a, a, a difficult term, but but it's 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 very easy. Uh, a dichotomous variable would mean, for example, like a blood culture. You know, a blood culture is either positive or negative. It's black or white, and there's nothing in between. And with the old troponin assays, that's pretty much how we use those, right? Uh, if a troponin was positive, that meant that is a heart attack. If a troponin was negative, that meant that's likely no heart attack. And if we use the sensitive troponins like that, we we lose a lot of performance. What they can do much more we have to use them like the age. For example, if you ask someone, how old is your patient? If the resident just tells you he is old, you will never be satisfied with that answer. That can mean a whole lot. And that's exactly the same with the troponin. You should never be satisfied with an answer kind of the troponin is positive or elevated. You should always ask what the elevation is. Is it just a minimal elevation, a mild elevation, a large elevation? Because that means a whole different thing. And that's kind of why kind of you should no longer use it as a troponin positive or negative but as a continuous variable. So Dr. Worcester, what do you think about the troponin being a dichotomous variable or a continuous variable? In other words, whether it should be just a pure rule-in, rule-out cutoff, or whether we should be thinking about it as a continuous variable where the higher it is, the more likely they are to have myocardial damage, and the lower it is, the less likely, and that we need to interpret it within that continuous variable. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I thought a lot about this. I mean, Dr. Reichlin is, is right in that we're losing a lot of information if we just use this dichotomously. The problem is we don't have enough studies on high-sensitivity troponins to be able to understand this as a uh, continuous variable. We see troponins that are off the scale. They're, they're in the thousands, but they're not all plaque ruptures. I mean, they're, they're different causes. So uh, we can't even make that assumption that if it's really high, it must be a plaque rupture, especially in the absence of corresponding ECG changes. We've got this universal cutoff for everyone. But really, do we all have the same baseline troponin levels? I mean, people of different sizes, of different activities, uh, different renal function, age and sex have both been proposed as uh, needing different troponin cutoffs. So, yeah, in principle, I agree. It would be great if we could use it as a continuous variable. I think what's more likely going to happen is that we will see categories, groupings of troponin ranges that will be more predictive of serious outcomes than others. Ah, so sort of like the age-adjusted D-dimer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. To help orient our listeners with a bit of background, I know you published a pilot study on this same algorithm in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2012. Before we jump into the current study, can you give us a brief summary of your prior findings? Yes, it's my pleasure. So back then, the the setup of the whole study back then was almost identical. So back in 2012, that's when when we had started um, using the testing clinical routine. Kind of, we wanted kind of to have such a protocol for ourselves, and that was our first guess. Kind of, how can we best possibly rule in and rule out patients? So we came up with the three arm algorithm, and in those first little less than a thousand patients, we came up out, up with those three groups, and we realized. 60% fall into the rule out group, 17% fall in the rule in group, so 77% can be triaged within one hour, and kind of there's all, about a quarter of patients that remain in the observational zone. And back then, we saw kind of negative predictive value of the of the protocol, of this initial protocol in the initial patient group was 100% negative predictive value and positive predictive value in this initial group was 80%. And we realized, obviously, that's good results, but we realized also that was the sample kind of that the algorithm was derived from or half of the sample was derived and half of the patients were validated. So we realized we need more validation. And I think the current paper right now kind of with um, with 1,300 patients, that's now the validation of this initial algorithm. With the rapid evolution of high-sensitivity troponins, I could find it pretty confusing to figure out how to apply a particular troponin from a study to the one that's used in my emergency department. Can you comment on what troponin you use and how it fits into the overall schema we see of high-sensitivity, super-high-sensitivity, ultra-high-sensitivity troponins? Okay, so, so it's basically two questions you're asking, and I'm going to start with the second one. It's, it's mainly the biochemists that kind of tell us what's a high sensitive assay, what's an ultra sensitive assay, what's a high ultra sensitive assay. And to me, that's more marketing than, than medicine. I think uh, a high sensitive assay, in my opinion, is kind of an assay that can measure the 99th percentile with a, with a high degree of certainty, so with a coefficient of variation of less than 10%. And as soon as an assay is able kind of to do that, I think we can call it a high sensitive assay. And in our experience, having a more sensitive and ultra sensitive assay that might kind of make the biochemist happy, but it's not going to add clinical value kind of to you and your patient. That's my take on on, on that marketing point. Mm -hmm. And then there's different sensitive and high sensitive assays out that kind of fulfill the criteria I just mentioned. And I think it's important to know that the, in our study, it was the the high sensitive cardiac troponin T assay from Roche Diagnostics that was used. And so the values we came up with in this algorithm should only be kind of applied if that assay indeed is being used. We and other groups, however, also came up with similar algorithms from assays of different manufacturers. So there's also kind of values and algorithms out for that. And I think you just should make sure that you are using the appropriate algorithm compared to the assay that you're using in your emergency room. Right. So if I am a chief in an emergency department and I'm thinking about implementing this protocol, 
what do I do if I'm using a different troponin than the one that you used in your study? Probably it's best is go to the literature, kind of to look out. Probably there's an algorithm out also kind of for the, for the troponin assay that you are using, and then you should apply that one. Dr. Worser, in the past when we were working up these low-risk chest pain patients, it was very important to determine the exact time that their chest pain started, and then we ordered the troponins based on four or eight hours after the onset of chest pain. Now with these new algorithms, we're kind of ignoring the onset of chest pain. The chest pain could have been five minutes before they arrived to the emergency department, or it could have been three hours or 10 hours. In this study, it was up to 12 hours that they included patients. What are your thoughts on whether we need to look at the time of onset of chest pain or not in working up these patients? That's a really good question. So the challenge here is when we use the time of onset of chest pain, we're making several assumptions. First of all, uh, that the patient knows the time of the onset of the symptoms. And a lot of times they're just guessing. We're assuming that chest pain is actually the primary ischemic symptom. So you have the patient who has uh, developed chest pain at four o'clock in the afternoon. But what if they tell you when they woke up, they didn't feel quite right? Noontime, they started developing nausea, and then four or five o'clock, they got some chest pain. At which point did the ischemia begin? And at which point was the ischemia significant enough to cause a release of troponin from the myocardiocytes enough to be measured in the blood. Right. So I guess what you're saying is that it's patients reporting when their chest pain started is horribly inaccurate, which is why we've now adapted this new way of doing things where we just ignore the onset of chest pain and just draw the troponins when they arrive. I wouldn't say completely ignore it. I think timing of symptoms is important. Let's face it. The person who has had continuous chest pain for 12 hours, uh, a normal ECG, we can, uh, that's unlikely to be ACS. The person who developed chest pain 20 minutes ago, my concern would be that there hasn't been enough time for the troponins to rise. And so you're going to have to monitor that patient for a little longer. All right. Now that our listeners have a good idea about the background and methods of the study, let's move into the juicy part, the results. Can you summarize your key results for us? Yeah. When applying the algorithm, it was very reassuring kind of to us to see that again, within one hour, we could um, apply about three quarters of the patients with a, with a diagnosis of either rule in that was kind of, again, in, in the range of 15% and drew out again that was in the range of 60%, while one quarter of the patients kind of remained in what we call the observational zone, needing further testing beyond one hour. For those kind of being ruled out within one hour, the negative predictive value again was 99.9%, so, so very, very high, and the positive predictive value for patients ruled in was 80%, meaning that again, Four out of five patients in that group indeed had a final diagnosis of a myocardial infarction. So Dr. Worcester, in this study, the outcome measure was based on two cardiologist adjudicators looking at the patient's clinical history, ECGs, echoes, angiograms, etc., to decide whether the patient ultimately ruled in or ruled out for MI. For the EBM keeners out there, how valid are these outcomes? And in an ideal world, what outcome measures would you want to see to be convinced of the data? Okay, so to answer the, the first question, how valid are they? Well, that really all depends because there's a couple of things going on here. We've got the first thing is incorporation bias, which means that the troponins that we use to make clinical decisions are also used in assessing the final outcome. That's incorporation bias. And what incorporation bias does, it inflates the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. Let's hear some more on incorporation bias from Dr. Reichlin. You mentioned it in your discussion, but one of the potential biases of this study is incorporation bias. For our, our listeners, an incorporation bias occurs when a test being studied is also used to make the final diagnosis. So in your study, the troponins that are used as part of the uh, protocol were also available to the cardi cardiologists who made the final diagnosis of MI. Can you comment on how that might affect your results? Mm -hmm. 
so that's, that's again a, a very fairly taken point. Now the, the current guidelines, the current universal definition of a myocardial infarction kind of mentions three cornerstones. First is kind of the, the, um, the patient history and physical assessment. The second is the patient's EKG and the third one is the cardiac troponins. So we will not be able kind of to establish um, a gold standard without using a cardiac troponin. And so that will, um, will be a problem in every study incorporation bias will be a problem in every study. In our study, that problem was that bias is probably larger than maybe in different studies because we use the same troponin for identification of the gold standard, the high sensitive cardiac troponin T, as we used in the algorithm. And from a methods aspect, um, that's, that's clearly a, a downside of our trial and would have been better probably to use a high sensitive cardiac troponin I test for establishing the gold standard and then to validate high sensitive cardiac troponin T algorithm against that high sensitive cardiac troponin I cold standard. Wonderful. It's great to hear those kind of responses from the study author. So that's all we're going to say about incorporation bias. Now Dr. Worser is going to explain verification bias and how it affects this study. The, the next problem is we have verification bias. So not all of these patients underwent the same tests. Some may have had stress tests, some may have had MIBI, some may have had angiography, and perhaps some had endoscopies uh, to rule in or to rule out myocardial infarction. So there's the verification bias. Not everyone is having the same test and not every test has equal diagnostic performance characteristics. So you really can't say with certainty who had an MI or uh, who didn't have an MI in every case, at least the same degree of certainty. Ideally, what you'd look for is clinical outcomes and specifically major adverse cardiac events. So death, myocardial infarction, have explicit definition for myocardial infarction. You could in include stroke with that. You could include uh, cardiovascular-related bleeding, all of those things. Let's listen to what Dr. Reichlin has to say about when it comes to a clear gold standard for the final diagnosis of MI once the patient is admitted to hospital. Uh, one of the biggest problems I have every time I read a paper about acute coronary syndromes is the lack of a clear gold standard. There really isn't a single test that tells us whether or not a patient has had an MI. In your study, you rely on the consensus of two cardiologists to make the final diagnosis. How might this somewhat subjective gold standard affect your results? Yeah, I think it's a, a very fair point you're you're taking here and kind of gold standard in the acute coronary syndrome business is very, very difficult. Some people thought in the beginning kind of having every patient going to the cat lab would help, but that's not going to help first. And second, it's not going to be ethical if you know it's only 20% having a heart attack, bringing everyone to the cat lab. So I think the best you can do is kind of to act as the doctor in the emergency room does, but in a standardized fashion and kind of what we did in this study is that two months after the patient had been to the emergency department, we made our first follow-up with the patients. Kind of, we contacted every patient and we collected every medical test that was done on this patient because for many patients that might have involved some pulmonary testing, it might have involved the gastroscopy in patients with reflux disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, stress testing that has been done as on an outpatient basis. So, kind of to get the best possible information on all of the patients. And then two independent cardiologists kind of um, looked through all the records and only if those two cardiologists agreed, um, the final diagnosis was made. So we tried to invest a lot of time and a lot of brain power to get a gold standard that was as accurate as possible. It's probably far away from perfect and it's probably not 100%, but we believe that's probably as good as you can get. And it's probably what is used in clinical practice every day. So you mentioned the very high negative predictive value. Uh, your algorithm did miss one patient. Uh, she had an initial uh, troponin of 10 nanograms per liter that only rose to 12 nanograms per liter in the first hour, but eventually peaked at 17 nanograms per liter. Is there anything you can tell us about this patient that will help us understand this one miss? So I think there's two, two important aspects here. So the one is that patient indeed 
had a small myocardial infarction, but that was a very, very small myocardial infarction. And so that's always kind of going to be the patients that are on the verge for, for being missed or not. And I think the second point, whatever algorithm, model, whatever testing you come up with, you will never be perfect. So no test, no algorithm, no nothing will ever reach 100% in real world. And I think that's just what we have to admit. And that's, that's reality. So there will always be patients kind of that, that will be missed, but we feel like with a negative predictive value of 99 point something percent, uh, we are on the, on the very safe side of things. Yeah, that's a very good point. But doctors aren't very good with a lack of perfection, are we? Yes. In the one case that was missed, it made me wonder what happened here. Was it that the patient came in so shortly after the onset of symptoms that the uh, measurements were done before the rise began. And because the story was suspicious, they held on to her and did a troponin at a later time, which turned out to be positive. From a North American perspective, a very high percentage of patients in your study ruled in for ACS. So 17% ruled in with MI and another 8.3% were diagnosed with unstable angina. Can you comment on how those numbers compared to other chest pain studies in emergency medicine? Yes. So kind of, you know, how many patients presenting with chest pain in the end will rule in kind of uh, largely depends also on how your healthcare system is organized. And we know from from many years of chest pain studies that the number of patients indeed having a myocardial infarction ranges somewhere from 4% often performed in North America to 25% in Australia or in Switzerland. And it depends on whether all your chest pain patients go kind of to the same um, emergency department or whether some chest pain patients are filtered out, go to a chest pain unit, and that explains the differences in between the, the various studies. Yeah, so do you have any thoughts on if I applied this protocol today in a North American emergency department, how the results might differ based on those baseline differences? Yes. So I think pretest probability will always kind of affect the results that, that you're getting. And I think if you are applying this algorithm that was tested in the current study, and if you apply that to an emergency room where kind of just a lower amount of patients will receive a final diagnosis of MI, so where the pretest probability is lower, your negative predictive value will be even higher. So you're certainly safe with applying this protocol. However, if your percentage of patients with a myocardial infarction is as low as 4%, then your positive predictive value for the ones that fall into the rule in-group will be lower than the 80% observed in the current study. Excellent. So there'll be more false positives potentially. Correct. All right. So the bottom line there is you really have to know your population and know the prevalence of MI in your population. And we can't totally ignore the time of onset of chest pain. The patients whose onset of chest pain was within an hour or two of their hospital arrival, we should maybe think about those patients a little bit more carefully and think about repeating the troponin longer than one hour and keeping them around for a bit longer. Yeah, it comes down to using our clinical decision-making skills. If you think that this is ACS and you don't believe the test results are are accurate, then you monitor the patient, you repeat the tests, um, and maybe you'll do other tests, but certainly don't just uh, automatically discharge them based on the troponins. So... Get a, just to get a little nerdy for a second, because that's sort of my nature. In your paper, you talk about the combination of the initial troponin and the one-hour delta being significantly better than the presentation troponin alone. And to compare those two strategies, you list an area under the curve, uh, and you talk about a 0.96 and 0.93 being the numbers respectively. For somebody who doesn't talk about area under the curves every day, how do I translate those numbers for my patients? In other words, is there a way for you to tell me how many patients I would have to subject to a second troponin? and test at one hour in order to prevent missing one in MI? That indeed kind of is probably on the nerdier end of questions <laughs> that I ever got. And, and to, be, to be honest, probably we would need an epidemiologist kind of to, to calculate the exact numbers for you. But I think the important point here is there have been several papers published that kind of if you present and your high sensitive troponin is below the level of detection of your test, 
probably you're safe and probably you don't need a second kind of troponin. But I think the second troponin becomes very, very important if your first troponin is elevated just a little bit above the 99 percentile because then kind of the delta, and we'll talk about it later, will be very, very important and that's what you need the what you need the one hour sample for. And I think that's where the, the particular value of a, of a second sample after one hour is. Right. So even in the new ACLS guidelines, they do talk about potentially using a single troponin in low risk patients. So there may be a role for that Correct. in some patients. Yes. All right. When it comes to the delta troponin, I sometimes wonder how much of a delta is significant. In this study, if the delta was less than 0.3 nanograms per liter, That was a rule out. And if it was more than five nanograms per liter delta, then that was a rule in. What can you tell us in general about how we should be interpreting the delta? How much of a delta should we be considering as significant? Well, that's a that's a great question, and so on. And I don't think anyone really knows the answer to this. So there there are a number of rules out there that that people have come up with, but we we don't have universal agreement. It's it's not like gravity, where everyone agrees that that uh, uh, on Earth it's nine point eight meters per second squared. In this case, number of different rules. One of the more common ones that I've seen is that for above the 99th percentile, a change in 20% in the value, in the measurement. So whatever your troponin is, the first troponin, you add 20% to whatever the first troponin is. If the second troponin is more than that, it's significant. If it's less than that, right. then that's not enough of a delta to be significant. Yeah, exactly. So that tells you whether there's a, a rise and fall. The problem is, as you get lower down into smaller measurements, then it becomes uh, more complicated, okay? And the amount that they use is actually, according to, to Peter Kavsak, who's a, a research clinical biochemist and world expert on troponins, he says, and he's published this, that the amount is within the allowable imprecision of the assay. So maybe their machines are so good that they can measure those those very small differences. But for most uh, hospital laboratories, I don't believe that's the case, that you're going to see those little fluctuations, which is uh, certainly acceptable within the normal variation of the measurement. What if the first measurement comes back really low and the second measurement is just under the 99th percentile. So technically, they're both less than the 99th percentile. Technically, the patient does not have myocardial injury. And uh, if you've decided they don't have unstable angina, you can send them home. I think that in that particular case, I'd go back and talk to the patient and uh, get a little more of the story. And I'd probably be tempted to repeat another one because we've seen the troponin increase so much that's outside of the imprecision of the assay, that there's something going on here. Again, you know, use your clinical skills and judgment. Okay, you had mentioned unstable angina. I just want to drive home the point to the audience that all these studies on troponin have nothing to do with unstable angina. That if a patient presents to the emergency department saying that their usual angina is more severe and more prolonged with exercise and it's a perfect story for unstable angina, having two negative troponins is irrelevant. So it just means that uh, they haven't suffered uh, sufficient sustained ischemia to cause uh, an increased release of troponin. That's all it means. Or to cause an ECG change. But it doesn't mean that they don't have acute coronary syndrome. Dr. Worcester is now going to talk about the general prognosis of an elevated troponin. Remember that troponins can be elevated by a variety of reasons. And I think it's important to understand that any elevation in troponin beyond the 99th percentile cutoff does portend a poor prognosis regardless of the cause. Nick Mills in his study showed that anyone, uh, regardless of presenting symptoms with an elevation in troponin has a poor outcome down the road uh, years later. So having an elevated troponin is not a good thing for you. 
I think probably the most important question that people will want to hear is, do you think this protocol is ready to be used in everyday practice? So I would say yes, but there's a, a few caveats. I think the high sensitive troponin test, once you start using those tests, there's a few teaching points in the beginning that, that you will have to make. And, and the, the biggest being kind of that you will see many, many more patients with a mildly elevated um, level of a troponin. Um, and then kind of the most important clues kind of to not be fooled there is kind of first that myocardial infarction is a clinical diagnosis. So clinical assessment probably becomes even more important than it's been before. Second is kind of to use it as a continuous variable and not just as a troponin positive or negative. And third is kind of the critical importance of, of the delta values and to see whether there's a rise and fall or where there's just a stable elevation of cardiac troponin levels kind of that tells you that that's a, a chronic elevation. And once you're more or less familiar with the way kind of to use the high sensitive tests, I think then, yes, you're, you're good. You can use the, tripon, the the algorithm, but then you just also need to keep in mind that algorithm is to be used in conjunction with clinical judgment. It's not that you, you're going to follow blindly to what the algorithm tells you. If the algorithm tells you that's a rule out, but there's some red flags that tells you, my gut feeling tells me there is something, sure enough, you should keep the patient in the emergency room for longer do additional testing on the on the other hand side. If the algorithm tells you that's a rule in, that doesn't mean that it's mandatory to take that patient kind of to the cat lab. It's still kind of clinical judgment, very, very important and probably even more important than before. Excellent. And so after this study, are you using this algorithm or, or protocol where you work? Yes. So we had, given that we had those results already from the first trial that we did in, in 2012, we had already started kind of using kind of the protocol in our emergency room. It's working out um, very nicely with the points I had just mentioned, and it was reassuring kind of to us and to all our um, doctors in our own hospitals kind of to see that the validation of the initial results was so successful. So the rule in and rule out categories seem very straightforward. However, 25% of the patients will still be in the so-called observational zone. How should a doctor think about and work up patients in the observational zone? So it's obvious that those patients kind of are the, the most difficult ones to judge because many of those are on the borderline of having a, a myocardial infarction or maybe having a, another cardiac problem such as heart failure or an arrhythmia or a valvular problem causing the, the minor elevation in troponin. So clearly those patients need more workup that cannot be done within an hour. So many of those need an echocardiography. Many of those need halter testing. Many of those need stress testing. But it's very important to keep in mind that those patients have a prognosis that is as worse as the prognosis of myocardial infarction patients. And that's probably because we fail in many of those kind of to really understand the problem. So I think it's worth taking the time and taking the pain kind of to, to do a testing until it becomes obvious what's the cardiac problem of those patients causing the minor elevation in troponin. So I think that's a very important point, just to, to emphasize that. So you said the, the long-term uh, prognosis of these patients is the same as your group of patients who ruled in. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. It's it kind of the patients in the observational zone had the same mortality um, after two years compared to the patients with a myocardial infarction. And and I think for many of those, it's because kind of if we have a heart attack, we know exactly what to do. We unblock the blocked artery that was blocked before, and then we treat with secondary prevention medication. And we know that's evidence-based medicine. They, they will do well. However, with the other ones that have a minor troponin elevation that does not result from a heart attack, we know that those patients have an even worse prognosis because, in part because um, they are more difficult to treat. Right. This is the only approach I know that not only attempts to rapidly rule out, but also rule in ACS. So working in the community with efficiency and wait times always in the back of my mind, this sounds like a really great way to get people through the emergency department quicker. Do you have any data on the efficacy or the cost of this algorithm yet? So, no, we don't have to fool that yet. We know from our own data that in our own hosp hospital, after introduction of the high-sensitive troponin assay and after introduction of the abbreviated protocol, that the time 
chest pain patients spend in the emergency room has gone down significantly. And if you think that you only need two hours kind of to work up a patient rather than six hours before, and if you think that one test um, costs in the range of 5 to $15, it's obvious we don't need a study to see kind of that we can save a lot of money here. I don't think it's quite that obvious that we'll be saving money with this protocol. You see, at Dr. Reichland's hospital, they're automatically drawing two troponins for every patient who presents with chest pain. So think about that. Depending on your patient population, this means drawing a heck of a lot of troponins, which costs oodles of money. While you might be decreasing length of stay and ruling in or out am I a bit faster with the automatic draws, I think we need to be aware of the downstream costs. So what I mean by that is many of those tropes will be false positives, which will lead to more needless testing with more costs and potentially iatrogenic morbidity as well. So Dr. Worcester, for the patient who's low risk, who comes in and you draw a troponin right when they come in, and that's negative, assuming that there's no other diagnoses that you're worried about, the ECG is normal, their story is low risk, they're low risk, single negative troponin, are we at the point presently where that single troponin is good enough to send the patient home without any further testing? So it's not ready for prime time yet. I expect that within the next couple of years, we're going to see some uh, some really good research being published on this. And hopefully we will see something that shows, uh, and ideally a randomized control trial that shows that with a single troponin in the right population, you can discharge these patients uh, home with, with uh, low probability of a major adverse cardiac event within the next you know, 30 days, six, six months. So that's Dr. Worcester's take on the future of troponin research. Let's hear what Dr. Reichler's take is. So what can we expect from you in the future? Do you have a next trial on ACS evaluation that we can look forward to? So I think we've talked about the randomized controlled trials in the in the very beginning. And obviously the question is kind of, um, shall the algorithm now be tested kind of in a randomized controlled trial? And I'm not 100% sure about the answer because on the one hand side, you would want to have that trial. On the other hand side, that would mean that despite the availability of such an algorithm and the new tests, you would have to keep patients in the emergency room for six hours as we used to do according to guidelines a few years ago. And given that the algorithm now already has gone into the new European guidelines, I'm, I'm not sure whether that randomized control trial will ever happen. On the other hand side, I think the next the next big question that comes up is with the new tests, we identify many more patients that have just very small myocardial infarctions. And we know that patients with a large myocardial infarction benefit from an early invasive strategy. However, we don't know what's the best possible treatment for the patients with just a very small myocardial infarctions that we are now able kind of to pick up. And I think that will be the very interesting next randomized control trial. Now, this trial didn't take into account the ECG or the patient's risk factors or some of the other things that some of the clinical decision rules take into account, like the heart score, for example. Let's hear what Dr. Worcester has to say about clinical decision rules. We haven't seen validation of any clinical decision rules using high sensitivity troponins yet. We may see that in the next couple of years. And so, Currently, the clinical decision tools that are out there don't seem to perform any better than clinical gestalt. So like the heart score or the Timmy score, the Goldman score, I think there's a whole slew of these uh, clinical decision rules that that are trying to help us rule out based on history and ECG and troponin. So I just want to clarify what you're saying is that, that clinical gestalt is as good as any of these clinical decision rules. Exactly. Well, it's good to know that the physician needs more than a computer to make their decisions for them. It's good to know that we can't be simply replaced by computers. Precisely. Well, as you've heard in this journal, Jam, ruling out MI is not so simple. We still need not only a pair of troponins, but our clinical gestalt, the patient's history, and eagle eye ECG reading skills to make decisions about our chest pain patients. 
Well, this study showed that it's pretty safe to send home chest pain patients after a pair of troponin T's drawn on arrival and one hour later that are both negative, we still need to use our clinical judgment and speak to our patients about the risks. We'd love to hear your comments on this journal gem on the EM Cases website. Now, I can't wait to meet those of you who registered for the EM Cases course on February 6th, and I'm really psyched for our new Crit Cases blog on the EM Cases website that's in collaboration with the STARS Air Ambulance Service. It should be live as you're listening to this podcast. We've got a great massive TCA overdose case that wasn't responding to bicarb boluses for the first one. Critical care and EM providers from around the world gave us their input on how to approach massive TCA overdose, and we'd love to hear your comments on the case as well, and also what you think of the blog in general. The other exciting project that we're working on is Beam Cases Blog. That's the best evidence in emergency medicine cases, where we present a case, and then we go through a series of articles and do critical appraisals of them, and then come out with some bottom line recommendations. And we've got a great team of people working on this one. We've got Justin Morgenstern. We've got EM Nerd himself, Rory Spiegel, and, of course, Dr. Worcester. So until next time, let's keep on jamming on the Journal Jam. Remember, you don't have to nerd out alone. Together, Together we're smarter. smarter.